doesn't always reflect the face we'd like the world to see. At 19, I had my nose fixed. At 28, I had the breast implants. And while we may pretend looks don't matter, most of us know better. We've all heard that there are women out there that find bald men sexy. I feel like saying, yeah, and I find women with mustaches to be attractive as well. Today, if you've got the time, the money, and the desire, there's no reason why you can't age gracefully. When I think, oh my gosh, to be, you know, 29 again and look that great. These days, when we look in the mirror, we just might call the plastic surgeon. I feel like I could be a more attractive person if I could change my nose. Follow four patients into the operating room and find out the price they're willing to pay for beauty under the knife. want to look our best because we believe our appearance is the first and most important impression we make on others but when that appearance doesn't measure up to our ideal millions turn to cosmetic surgery to find happiness I would use the word pain that given a choice I would not prefer to look this way uh, given a choice I would prefer to have hair New York businessman George Conley is unhappy about the fact that he's bald 42 and still single, George feels his lack of hair is a liability. In terms of approaching a woman, I think the appearance factor without hair is going to make you look older, and that's not necessarily perceived as being attractive. Debbie Bundy loves the sun, but the sun hasn't loved her back. Although she's enjoyed an outdoor lifestyle, sun-damaged skin has caused her grief. I'm definitely paying for it now. Without a doubt, my, my skin is definitely showing the signs of, of all that living that I did outdoors. And at times I feel kind of like the old goat in the crowd. Sunscreen sales may be at record levels, but many people still suffer the consequences of the sun's powerful rays. The damage for longshoreman Lori Smith has been a condition known as a pregnancy mask. During pregnancy, elevated hormone levels can cause a brownish discoloration of the face, which is exaggerated by exposure to sunlight. I was 32 years old, pregnant with my daughter, and all of a sudden these brown splotches just like boom, came out. It was shocking. School teacher Kimberly Reese says she has had her problem for as long as she can remember. Despite the bucolic setting of a day with her boyfriend in Atlanta's Piedmont Park, a cloud hangs over Kim, all because of her nose. The comments I've heard all through my life about my nose have been, you know, very painful, and I've cried about it. At 28, Kim keeps her figure attractive with hikes and workouts, but her facial structure is beyond her control. I don't think I'm ugly. But there's always the thought in the back of my mind. I feel like I could be a better, more attractive person if I could change my nose. Tab Burris, her boyfriend of 10 years, thinks Kimberly is perfect the way she is. When Kim told me she was having the surgery, I told her that she was beautiful and that I loved her. And that I just don't think God means for people to change what he has made of them. I think he's worried that I'm never going to be happy with the way I look. I just know that I could be a happier person if I fixed my nose. Someone is not feeling attractive, is not getting much response from other people. This immediately lowers their self-esteem, lowers their status within the group, and it becomes a very painful process. So if they want to, now they have available to them a host of procedures to make their features conform more to some standardized ideal. Despite Tab's reassurance, Kim decides to undergo a rhinoplasty or nose job operation. The first step of the process is the consultation with a board-certified plastic surgeon. Kim's research has led her to Dr. Brian Maloney, who practices in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. 
surgery. Kim, as you look in the mirror, what types of changes would you like to see about your nose? My main concern would be right here, where the hump in my nose is, and towards the end of my nose, and the ends here where it's uneven. Hey, Kim, let me have you turn, and let me just take a peek at your nose here. Photos are taken next, and the pictures are fed into a computer, providing a digital glimpse of what Kim's future could look like. I'm going to be able to show you some changes on the computer imager, and then what I'm looking for from you is a reaction. And this image is going to be something that we can both look at at the same time and come to agreement upon, and then we'll be able to take that to the operating room and try to reproduce that for you. Okay. So, Kim, we'll just kind of bring the tip back a little bit for you, and then we'll bring down the, the bridge. Just kind of soften things up. Dr. Maloney suggests a chin implant to help Kim achieve her goals. A chin implant? What exactly does that have to do with my nose? That would help to bring the lower part of your face into a little bit better balance and help to soften some of the, uh, the prominence of your nose. While Kim had never considered a chin implant, Dr. Maloney's justification for it is persuasive. She wants the whole package. What do you think about that? I think it looks a lot better. I love it. It's perfect. When can we do this? <laughs> Kim yearns for a surgical alteration of a feature that's beyond the scope of makeup. But Lori Smith can cope, at least temporarily, with cosmetics. I use this concealer on my problem areas every day to cover up my pregnancy mask, which was very, very dark. It was dark along my cheek here. The products that I've been using have helped to lessen it, but as you can see, it's still there. Another sun damaged casualty, Debbie Bundy, also manages to improve the look of her complexion with makeup. At all costs, I try never to go out of the house without makeup on. I feel very insecure about going outside without makeup on. I, I, I feel scary. George Conley, who is bald, also feels vulnerable in public. To avoid embarrassment, he's found a temporary solution. I had never been a hat person. I always felt that I looked like uh, Benny Hill in a hat. There's hat people and there's non-hat people. I always considered myself a non-hat person. Having my hair thinned out and eventually lost, I have become a hat person. Because no hat or makeup can hide her nose, Kimberly Reese is determined to create a new self-image. Her rhinoplasty surgery takes place in a surgical center next to Dr. Maloney's office. On the day of the operation, Kim arrives with her parents and her boyfriend, Tab. She has no second thoughts about what she's doing. If it could help my self-esteem and help me feel a little more confident when I'm about and a little less paranoid when people are looking at me, then I think that it would be worth it to do that. Kim is nervous, not about the operation, but the IV needle used in the general anesthesia process. This is not the fun part. Oh, what hand are we doing it on? I have to I'm do it this okay. one, okay? okay. Uh -huh. Can I put a tourniquet around your arm first? Oh, uh, just okay. Just looking. I'm done. We're done. Despite all precautions, cosmetic procedures do come with risks. Infection, cardiac or breathing problems, or that the results may not be pleasing. Dr. Maloney and his staff take great pains to prevent mishaps. When the procedures are done in a licensed, a fully accredited facility, the chance of having anything catastrophic is extremely low. Kim is now completely out. Q-tips dipped in a 10% pharmaceutical cocaine solution are placed in her nostrils to help control bleeding in the easily ruptured capillaries inside the nose. This actually will help to shrink down the membranes and it also help to start to anesthetize them as well. But the first order of business is the chin implant procedure. Anesthetic is injected to numb the immediate surgical area. The operation will begin with an incision inside Kim's mouth. Dr. Maloney works the tissue away from the bone of her chin to make a pocket for the implant. The right most important thing about placing chin implants is we want to make sure that we're all the way down to the bottom edge of the bone here. And 
We want to make sure that our pockets are nice and symmetrical, okay? The chin implant, which is made of a silicone-like material, can now be inserted. It has a little stripe down the middle of it that will help us to assure that it's placed in the midline position for Kim. Dr. Maloney then closes the incision with dissolvable sutures. Kim is on the way to achieving her goals. I'm going to switch sides to the table and begin the nose surgery. One of the reasons rhinoplasty has become so popular is because the nose is the central focus of the face. While the top third is actually bone, the lower two-thirds are made up of cartilage. This flexible material supports the nose and gives it its shape. It is Kim's cartilage that Dr. Maloney will sculpt. The excess cartilage that we're going to be removing from Kim's nose has been, from her perspective, the enemy all these years. The entire operation will be done through Kim's nostrils. There will be no visible scars. Before I remove any cartilage on the inside of the nose, I want to make sure that I develop in my mind's eye how much of the cartilage I'm going to be removing from the top so that I leave enough support on the inside for her. Scissors and scalpels are used to remove a variety of shapes and sizes of cartilage. Even a hammer and chisel are necessary to get the job done. As he finishes removing cartilage from each area of the nose, Dr. Maloney sews up the nasal membranes he's had to cut through. This is a dissolvable suture, but it'll be in there for about the next two months for her. Dr. Maloney now turns his attention to the hump of cartilage along the bridge of Kim's nose. This is the main culprit that's been causing Kim all these problems for all these years. This is the hump of the nose. This actually sat right along the top just like this. The lower portion is cartilage, and then right here is the transition with the nasal bones. And that helps us to make some progress in the right direction. After three hours of surgery, Dr. Maloney is pleased with the initial results. Great. Looks beautiful. Yet one step vital to success still remains. The application of the dressing is equally as important as anything that we've done up to this point. It's extremely important that we milk out all the swelling of the nose, even to the point of exaggeration, and then we put our dressing on. That dressing will stay on for approximately one week and help to keep our structures in their new position. It also helps to keep the swelling out of the area. Upon awakening in the recovery room, Kim is groggy and uncomfortable. Oh, no, no, it's hard. What happens when Kim learns the real price of beauty and George pursues a surgical solution for hair loss? It looks like head floss. <laughs> Atlanta school teacher Kimberly Reese has just come out of a three-hour rhinoplasty surgery to fix her nose. Kim hopes that her new nose and chin implant will bring her the self-acceptance she's never known. In the meantime, she faces some serious pain and discomfort. Over the next 24 to 48 hours, Kim's going to experience some swelling. That's why it is very important for her to keep her head elevated tonight and to keep some ice compresses going. Kim has a long night ahead of her. Her dressings have to be changed every 15 minutes. The next morning, she is miserable. Kim is obviously suffering and paying a high price for beauty, $7,200 to be exact. But is this just a case of vanity? The strongest impetus for undertaking cosmetic surgery is in point of fact to pass that is you identify with a group and you want to become a member of that group 
And that's a very important part of the sort of end goal of all aesthetic surgery. It's becoming invisible in a category to which you want to belong. The era of the modern nose job began in the late 19th century in Germany, when Jacques Joseph, a Jewish doctor, perfected a scarless procedure to help a largely Jewish clientele blend in with their German peers and avoid anti-Semitism. And that was Jacques Joseph's great contribution. He was able to make them invisible. In America, the popular Jewish vaudeville star Fanny Bryce had rhinoplasty in 1923, inspiring one critic to comment that she had cut off her nose to spite her race. But four decades later, another popular Jewish star refused cosmetic surgery. Barbara Streisand in the 1960s was urged by her agent to have her nose altered, to have it made less prominently Jewish. She absolutely refused to do that. And the great irony, of course, is that she was cast in her first major film role as Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl. The film and TV industries are powerful transmitters of accepted norms of beauty in our culture. In Southern California, laser candidate Debbie Bundy feels the pressure from the presence of the media. What I see as a Southern California resident in the media, all the magazines, the girls on the beach, you know, rollerblading down the beach, they've got the perfect bodies, the perfect face. The same images affect Lori Smith, who's struggling to find a solution to the pregnancy mask, which has discolored her face. That's what everybody wants, is a size two with perfect skin and the perfect body, and it's pretty much Im impossible. So you do everything you can to make yourself look as good as you can. For Lori, keeping up with the popular culture Joneses has included two prior cosmetic surgeries. At 19, I had my nose fixed. At 28, I had the breast implants. I love my breasts, I love my nose, and I'm very happy with both results. I would recommend it to anybody. The body image really encompasses our thoughts, perceptions, and feelings about our body and our bodily experiences. It accounts for how we think about our bodies, how we feel about our bodies, and what we do with our bodies behaviorally. More recent research has really suggested that the majority of cosmetic surgery patients are in fact quite psychologically healthy and may in fact be doing this as ways to improve an already uh, high functioning quality of life. They're not uh, overly vain and running around just thinking about their appearance, that they're more likely to go to the gym uh, and exercise, that they're more likely to eat a healthy diet. They're seeing cosmetic surgery as being very much like other parts of a good self-care regime, like a healthy diet, like regular exercise. The motivation toward cosmetic surgery isn't isolated to one gender, and it's becoming more and more acceptable for men to surgically alter their looks. It used to be if a man went in for plastic surgery, a psychiatrist almost invariably would give him a diagnosis because it was so odd in their idea. He must be depressed, he must be obsessive, he must be narcissistic. Today there isn't nearly that kind of stigma or idea that a man who cares about his parents um, is anything but, you know, perhaps normal in responding to societal pressure. 42-year-old George Connolly is considering hair transplant surgery to help him cope with feelings of inadequacy. Being bald is difficult for me. Right away you stand out. I'm doing this because I feel that I would probably be perhaps maybe more appealing to the opposite sex with, with more hair than what I have. George feels more hair would also help him in business. Uh, just got out of the meeting there. So... I certainly want to come across as someone who's on top of their game. If I have something about my appearance that makes me look perhaps older than, than I truly am, uh, I'd like to do something about that. George not only decided to do something about his thinning hair, he searched for the best surgeon to do the job. He has driven four hours from New York City to meet hair transplant specialist, Dr. Michael Beener. Dr. Uh, Mike Beener. Hi, George Conley. George? At the consultation, they discussed George's medical history, including the progression of his hair loss, which is a hereditary problem. Like 35 million other men in America, George has inherited a gene which makes him susceptible to early hair loss. 
Hair growth is governed by androgens, like testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. As these androgen levels rise as men age, hair growth diminishes. But George is not interested in the past. His concerns are with the future. Uh, when the entire procedure is complete, what can I expect? What we can do, this entire frontal area of the head and then the mid-scalp here, so we're excluding this crown here, okay. but this whole top horizontal area, you know, we can in three or four sessions make it appear to be as thick as the sides of your head. Really? Okay. With no question. Now, if you actually went in with a microscope, it wouldn't be as thick as sure. that, but it doesn't need to be, because we've proven that if you just accomplish 50% of the density, the human eye cannot tell the difference. Okay. The surgical process will involve removing individual hair follicles from the back of George's head and transplanting them to the top where he is bald. But the results will only be as good as the raw materials Dr. Beener has to work with. And a lot of times there's a little tug of war that goes on between the doctor and the patient. The patient wants all of this. You tell him, well, I can only give you this much. And if he's realistic and mature and he understands your arguments about the future and what happens, he accepts it and he becomes a happy patient. Thanks, George, for coming very much. George is pleased with the consultation and he drives home confident he's found the right doctor. It's very similar to shopping for a mattress. It's comfort. This is something that's going to be a part of George for uh, hopefully a great long while. Ooh, that big wipeout. For Debbie Bundy, satisfaction will come in the form of facial laser resurfacing. But $4,500 for a new complexion is a steep price. It is very expensive, but I feel that it is very, very worth it or I wouldn't be doing it. Getting rid of her pregnancy mask will also cost Lori Smith. Elevated hormone levels and overexposure to the sun during pregnancy resulted in a dark banding on her face. But laser resurfacing is not for her. That procedure just scared me. I think it's like very evasive to your skin and everything. So Lori will opt for a TCA peel, a chemical treatment that will cost $650, considerably less than laser resurfacing. For George Connolly, the $10,000 it will cost to restore his hair and his self-esteem is well worth it. He's returned to Dr. Michael Beener for the first of three hair restoration procedures that will take place over the next year. Each surgery will cost $3,500, but George's focus is on bang, not bucks. Well, Jared, George, you all set for your big day here? Yeah, I think so. I'm all excited. Right. You really won't feel The it. strategy for the operation is literally mapped out on George's head. These lines will guide Dr. Beener in placing the hair grafts. I draw out the zones where I'm going to place the appropriate size grafts. And, and this goes along with the artistic concept of making the hair look natural. The next step that we do is to get the patient comfortable so this is not a painful procedure. It supplies sensation to the whole front half of the head. George is given a light sedative via an IV, but will be awake during the entire procedure. He's also given the first of a series of injections of nerve block and local anesthetic into his scalp. Dr. Beener then shaves the back of George's head, where his hair is still fairly thick. This is called the donor area. Shaving will allow Dr. Beener's staff to later cut the donor area into individual hair follicles more easily. The donor area is the area of what we think will be permanently growing hair for the rest of that person's lifetime. Basically, it's that middle 50%, not too close to the bottom, not too close to the top, that is the donor hair. George, this will smart a little bit. Not as bad as needles, though. Dr. Beener will remove a strip of scalp from George's donor area, from which the individual follicles will then be cut. But first, he numbs the area with a series of injections. I'm now going to do what we call tamessing, uh, which means I'm going to firm up the tissue with salt water. And it's got a little adrenaline in it to help keep the bleeding down to very close to nothing. Then, using a special scalpel that has four blades, Dr. Beener scores the donor strip he has fairly shallow hair shaft lengths, which is nice. That means I don't have to go as deep and there's less chance of hitting blood vessels. Then cuts all around it. We're gradually freeing up this uh, strip and taking it out. 
and finally removes a 22 centimeter strip of scalp. Dr. Beener shows it to George, who hasn't lost his sense of humor. Wow, it looks like head floss. <laughs> Will George's fantasy of a full head of hair become a reality? And modern medicine's cure for sun-damaged skin. Oh. An admittedly unscientific survey conducted by America Online found that 25% of respondents said they would sacrifice five years of life for a full head of hair. Hair transplant patient George Connolly has just completed the first of three hair restoration surgeries. With a 22 centimeter strip of scalp removed, George's head is cauterized to reduce bleeding, then bandaged, but it won't be sutured until later. I just put plastic over it and sew it in place. Thank you. Afterwards, George relaxes while Dr. Beener's surgical assistants separate out the pre-scored donor strip and then, under a microscope, divided into 900 separate hair grafts. The part of the procedure that had just finished removing the, the donor section, I would think that that would have been the toughest part for me, but I feel actually quite good. Like the lion's mane, the mane of man has long been a symbol of power and virility. In the Bible, when Samson loses his hair, he also loses his legendary strength. Abundant hair symbolizes health, power and invincibility to the forces of aging. So it is not surprising that man has sought solutions for hair loss since the dawn of time. Camel dung was once thought to encourage hair growth, and wigs and toupees have long provided a temporary cover. But it wasn't until the 20th century that more permanent and practical solutions came about. Taking little plugs of hair and putting them into areas that are bald was first discovered by a Japanese doctor, Okuda, back in the 1930s, but nobody knew about it because of the war and nobody read Japanese journals. Upon further experimentation, the plugs were replaced by smaller grafts of hair, which created a more natural look. While hair transplant surgery, such as George Connolly's, is the number one hair restoration procedure, there are two other methods commonly used to combat baldness. One is called the flap method. A literal flap of hair it's freed up in a series of three operations and brought across the front and set into place. The other procedure is a scalp reduction. In a series of surgical operations, areas of bald scalp are removed and sections of hair growing scalp are pulled toward the center to fill in a bald crown. Cosmetic surgery's ultimate aim is not merely a full head of hair or a smaller nose, however, but happiness itself. How can we make people happy? By altering their bodies to conform with the ideals of themselves that they want. Dr. Michael Beener and his staff are about to alter George Connolly's hairline to give him the ideal he wants. 900 holes are punched in George's scalp, where the grafts will then be inserted. This is where the artistry comes in. The results have to look natural, and anticipate George's future hair loss pattern so that grafts can be planted in those areas. I go in a zigzag line because then I set up a pattern of irregularity. What we're trying to avoid is, is any kind of rose or doll head look or cornrows or any of those bad words that traditionally have been mentioned with transplants. Once all the holes have been punched, the donor area incision on the back of George's head is closed. And he'll have a paper thin scar here which would be almost impossible to find in six months, even by a hairdresser. Once the surgical assistants have finished cutting up the individual grafts, they begin inserting them into the holes in George's scalp, according to the grid pattern Dr. Beener has laid out. How does it look up there? It looks great. Good. There you go. George spends the night in Saratoga Springs, keeping his head covered so that scabs can form, which will hold the grafts in place until they settle in. It will be 24 hours before he can wash his hair. Feel actually pretty good after the uh, after the procedure. I uh, came back to the hotel room and my head started feeling somewhat numb. So I had take, taken the uh, prescribed uh, medication, got something to eat, and feel pretty good. George won't see any hair for three months, 
And uh, so he's operating on faith until then. Uh, but uh, we always can tell them 100% of the time, in all the years we've been doing it, the hair has always appeared. While George may be getting hair in order to attract a mate, Lori Smith has found her true love and wants to look her best for her upcoming wedding. Lori hopes the dermatologist, Dr. Susan Goodlerner of Torrance, California, can help her get rid of facial discoloration. Hi, Lori. Hi. How are you? Fine. Hi. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, it's been a couple of years. You're actually a great candidate for a TCA peel. What we know is that people with fair skin like you, people with blue eyes, tend to heal very well from this. Thing. Darker skin carries a greater risk of discoloration from the acid used in a TCA peel. Right. TCA is trichloracetic acid. It's an acid that will peel the top layer of the skin and it's been used in dermatology very widely. Okay, you comfortable? Oh yeah. Alright. Uh, the nurse removes the natural oils on Lori's face, oil. necessary for even penetration of the acid. Feels like a bunch of ants on your face or something. Once the prep work is complete, Dr. Goodlerner steps in and makes sure that Lori will be comfortably relaxed for the procedure. We're going to be giving Lori some Ativan, which is a short-acting Valium, and this medicine put under the tongue works right away. The acid is applied with two-by-two two gauze that's been dipped in the solution. Lori holds a fan to cool her off. The stinging is intense. Oh, yeah, it does sting. I just can't imagine that I'm that big of a baby, but it felt like someone had a blowtorch to my face. Just about done. Okay. When the skin is a uniform white, Dr. Goodlerner knows the acid has been evenly applied. Okay, we're all done. The process of chemical peeling with TCA actually stops itself. It doesn't need to be neutralized. What the ice water and ice packs do are to relieve any symptoms of stinging or burning. Healing ointment is then applied. Tell you after this, I'll definitely be slathering my face with sunscreen. I bet you will. Kimberly Reese finds out whether happiness is as plain as the nose on her face. Lori Smith's desire for better skin. And George Connolly undergoes his second hair transplant procedure when we return. After having a TCA chemical peel to get rid of her pregnancy mask, Lori Smith stays home waiting for her face to heal. When I first came home, and like today, I'm just like, oh my God, what did I do? A week later, Dr. Goodlerner checks Lori's progress. She told me it was going to burn, but I guess in my head, I didn't like really think it was going to burn. The pain part, after about an hour, two hours, it was gone. And the rest of it was just uncomfortable and not looking too hot for a week. This was a lot of the dead skin cells are peeling off. That's what all the brown discoloration is. While the pain is gone, Lori worries if she will be ready for her wedding day in Jamaica. <laughs> it's been one week since Kimberly Reese had nose reconstruction surgery and a chin implant. With great expectations, she's back and ready to see the early stage of the results. I can't. Hey, Dr. Maloney. I, I can't believe it's already been a week. I know. <laughs> I'm nervous. Okay, no, nothing to be nervous about. Okay. okay. Though Kim is still swollen and bruised, the results are clearly a big improvement, and she is delighted. Ah, oh, I love it. Great. Oh. You like it? You like it? Yeah. Great. A Great. lot. Great. Okay. Oh my God. Two and a half months later, Kim is even happier with her new look. Dr. Maloney said it'll take up to a year for it to completely heal and all the swelling to go down. And I understand that, but I, I love it now. I'm much happier with myself now. And I, every week it changes, and I think, you know, by the end of the year, I'm going to absolutely be just thrilled with it. Is that okay? All right. All right, dude. Debbie Bundy also wants to be happy with her looks and hopes that facial laser resurfacing will help her reach that goal. I know that I'm a young person. I know that I have a lot of living to do. But when I look in the mirror, I see the signs of aging that, that make me feel unhappy. Here Debbie has turned to Santa Monica, California dermatologist and plastic surgeon Dr. Ava Shamban for help. 
you've got a lot of these brown spots here, mm -hmm. which are from the sun, right. and we call that dyspigmentation or dyschromia. Mm -hmm. you also Debbie has very realistic expectations. She's not expecting to look like she was 19 years old, but she is expecting to have her sun damage spots gone, her pigmentation problem fixed, and her fine lines really corrected. And she's going to have all of those issues addressed and greatly improved. The first step in laser resurfacing is the application of numbing cream. Next, Debbie is given anesthesia. She is going to receive a very light IV anesthesia. This will be enough to put her into a state where she will be slightly awake, but she will not feel any pain. Plastic shields will be inserted underneath Debbie's eyelids to protect her eyes from the laser. Laser technology relies on highly concentrated beams of light to vaporize skin layers. The entire external layer of skin, or epidermis, and a portion of the dermis, the layer below, are targeted. Okay, the patient is now sedated, and what I'm going to do is start the laser. Um, I'm going to do probably two to three passes with the CO2 laser on her face and her forehead. Dr. Shamban works methodically, removing the top layer of Debbie's skin. The white lines that are forming are actually Debbie's epidermis crisping up. The second pass goes a quarter of the way into the dermis. During this pass of the laser, you can see the skin tightening. Okay. For the final pass, Dr. Shamban switches over to the Erbium YAG laser. This device emits a cooler and thus more gentle beam, which is much safer for the delicate skin on Debbie's eyelids and neck. There, it's better. From anything the eye shields from are now removed, and Debbie's face is bandaged with a clear mask. The purpose of the mask actually is to shield the skin. The other thing is, as the skin begins to heal now, it produces an exudate, which is some serum that has a lot of healing growth factors in it. And what the mask does is it keeps these right next to her skin. So it actually speeds up the healing process. Yeah. Debbie's surgery went absolutely fabulous. Her skin has tightened up to a dramatic extent. Her sun damage is, is going to be totally healed and, and gone. Six weeks later, Debbie's skin is completely healed, and she's thrilled with the result. And while she's not ready to give up her outdoor lifestyle yet, Debbie slathers on sunscreen to protect her new complexion. I feel like the resurfacing really accomplished a lot in reference to some of the wrinkles that I had on the sides of my eyes, and I had some pretty deep lines in between my eyebrows, and it also made my skin a lot smoother, as well as, you know, reducing the amount of age spots and sunspots that I had developed on my skin. If I had it to do over again, I'd do it in a heartbeat. For hair transplant patient George Connolly, the journey is a bit more complicated. After two months, little hairs from his first set of grafts are appearing. And his second surgery will make an even more dramatic difference in George's appearance. When you go back for the second procedure, the third procedure, you're basically going back in between the cracks from what you did the first time. Lori Smith gets her day in the sun. And George says goodbye to hats and hello to a thicker head of hair when we return. Discretion is advised. Not too bad. How about yourself? Pretty good. Four months after his first hair transplant procedure, George Connolly is back, sprouting some new hair and ready to go under the knife again. Why don't you sit for a second here? Sure. Give me your hat. Okay. Give you want to take this there, for me? Sure. You have a seat there, George. Let me just inspect what we've got here so far. Dr. Beener checks to see how much growth has occurred in the grass from the first procedure. In the first three months, it didn't grow, of course. After the first procedure, I'm looking for a fine feathered hairline, and I want to start the density in the middle. It looks like we got you know, nearly 100% growth. 
And the patient does come back, you know, usually three times altogether. So I have three chances to get that density in there. And, Any uh, comments by friends or acquaintances? Or no? Yeah, it's like the, there is uh, something there where there was not <laughs> previous. So, That's great. Uh, Right. What's really going to make the biggest difference when I see you next time isn't even going to be what I put in today. What it's going to be is the length that you get on this between now and next time. As with the first procedure, a strip of scalp on the back of George's head is chosen for the donor area and shaved to make cutting of the grafts easier. Dr. Beener checks the direction of hair growth so he can match the new grafts to this pattern. We're always combing it to see the natural direction of the hair. And here we go. Becky will be counting for me as I do it. Holes are punched to accommodate the grafts. And working in the zones Dr. Beener has marked out, the nurses place grafts containing one to six hairs to fill in gaps left from the first procedure. Dr. Beener, thank you very much. We'll see you in a couple of months. Good. It's almost like buying a, a, a reasonably priced secondhand car, which I'll be driving for life. Three months later, George is back for his final procedure. Hi, Dr. Bina. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. While it will take a year for George's new look to finish taking shape, two months after having a TCA facial peel, Lori Smith looks and feels like a new woman on her wedding day. I think it turned out great. It took out a lot of the pregnancy mask underneath my chin, all pretty much gone. And the lines around my eyes, I think that they have gone away considerably. So overall, I'm very happy with the TCA peel. This is just, to me, like preventative maintenance. You go and have a facial once a month, you go and have this done once a year, you know? Keep those wrinkles away. We live in an age which really does believe in self-transformation. One of the reasons it's been easier to talk about this in public is that it is really part of our belief that we can change ourselves, uh, that we have the power to affect our own destinies, our own bodies. After a year, three surgeries, and over $10,000, George Connolly has finally gotten the results he dreamed of. I'm finding myself spending a little more time in the uh, personal toiletry aisles of supermarkets. I'm happy with what it is now, and it's only going to get better, so no complaints. It's almost like, for me, not having hair was almost like that toothache. It would come and go, but it was always there, like going through and having hair transplants. That cavity's been filled for me, so it's an ache I don't have to feel anymore. And George is feeling confident enough to re-enter the dating world with a whole new attitude. In terms of dating, it's a nice shot in the arm. It's one less thing to, to be self-conscious of. I just find myself having a better self-image, finding even some younger women maybe being attracted to me. I actually feel less inclined to wearing hats than I used to. I can't leave the house without a pocket comb now. I've been able to do that for a good number of years. Cosmetic procedures are transforming thousands of lives, like George Connolly's, each year. And it is a trend that seems likely to continue growing as more and more people are taking advantage of everything science has to offer. We look into the mirror and we see what we want to see. We see beauty where other people may not see beauty. We see ugliness where other people may see beauty. When you make judgments about yourself, you're bringing a lot of things into play. You're bringing in your own personal history. You're bringing in an enormous amount of psychological as well as social baggage. As cosmetic surgery continues to gain in both popularity and acceptance, many people are attempting to leave that baggage behind and step lightly into a new life. This has been a special presentation of the all-new Discovery Health Channel. Come with us inside the fascinating world of real-life drama, medical breakthroughs, and human triumph every day on the Discovery Health Channel. Come with us. The new Discovery Health Channel. Be inside the fascinating world of real-life drama, medical breakthroughs, and human triumph.